Good afternoon, everybody. This is about the labor by vikingsterritory.com. I am your host, Joe Johnson, owner of that site, purpleptsd.com, purpleterritoryradio.com, the upcoming oofta.mn, and the draftteam.com. Yikes. Um, I'm here with the brand spanking new editor of that network spreading faster than COVID-19. Gary O'Connor, how you doing, man? Uh, I'm good. I was out sick for most of last week after we recorded the podcast, and I'm feeling a lot better. So, pretty good. Not COVID, by the way, just oh. so everybody's aware. <laughs> okay, well, I lined up gonna be awkward but deshaun is gonna be co-editor because we thought for sure you're gonna die but you know there's always the next unfortunately time. unfortunately for you still here i wanted i just want your switch to be honest um <laughs> and the person uh fake laughing at my jokes as always <laughs> is deshaun Vaughn. Uh, i got a real one out of him that time he is the managing editor of purple and uh <laughs> has been churning out some great articles this week i feel like we're the us three we really we're the we're the glue um of this entire deal how you doing man you feeling better about the jefferson pick maybe i was looking reading your we wrote kind of similar um jefferson fit how he fits on the offense like dueling our articles yours was on ptsd mine was on vikings territory and um I liked yours. It probably got you less death threats than mine did. He has a fit, for sure. Um, just with some of the things that he's able to do. And I think um, in the article, in the recent article I've put out, I think um, some people will be surprised at who I think takes over the role of the deep threat in the offense. Ooh. Ooh. Do they have to go read it to, to know? Or Should or? Well, I think we'll, we'll discuss it here, too. So we'll, okay. we'll, we won't force them to read. <laughs> Nobody likes reading. Um, that's a good segue as Mr. Justin Jefferson uh, came out this week and, and essentially said, pull the Randy Moss, pull the Randy Moss. Oh, you're probably not old enough to remember that horrible KWB song. Um, and said he essentially was going to make teams that passed on him pay. And a lot of people were... Um, on the internet, kind of comparing him to Josh uh, Rosen, who said something similar and who's on his third team at this point. But I think, obviously, Moss is the more apt comparison. Um, I I mean, I want your guys' take on that, and, and, and as it ties into the fit on this offense, I do think that um, any sort of additional motivation a rookie or especially a wide receiver like receivers need a little bit of like narcissism because you have to work so hard and it's you know really me driven uh, as a position more so than than others on the field and so having that chip on his shoulder i think is a good thing um but at the same time i mean i i i, I could see why he he felt slighted a little bit um what was he the fourth or fifth receiver taken at that point i think I, he was the fifth the fifth receiver okay um, so I take it as, as good news. I mean, maybe a little, you know, one of the quotes that I, I saw on Twitter that stuck out to me was somebody essentially was saying a lot of guys say this before they actually, you know, get to practicing even against NFL players and seeing kind of what the learning curve is. It's kind of hard to say that it's like uh, Leonard Fournette coming out and saying how after like his first practice that the NFL was a cakewalk and it wasn't as hard as everyone said it was and, you know that hasn't really necessarily mm-hmm. worked out that great for him. Um, but uh, Deshaun, what was what were your thoughts on that? And and if you want to tie it into your article about the fit that that he has on this offense, or perhaps lack thereof. So I think uh, the the guys who were drafted ahead of him, I'm like the first three were pretty obvious, and I think the one he's more upset about is probably Jalen Rigger to the Eagles being picked. I think what, like one or two picks ahead of him. Um, so. player more that he just fits more systems well i think everybody in nfl already kind of has that first down maker kind of guy 
if you look at us, you know, the Packers have Devontae Adams, the Lions have um, Marvin Jones, and then the Bears have Allen Robinson. So even within our division, everybody already has that, you know, I work between the 12 and the 14, 15 yards guy on their team. So when teams just kind of get a chance to be like a Tyreek Hill kind of player that can score from anywhere on the field, a guy to be the big play guy in the offense. I, for one, am not necessarily for that title because in his career, he, I mean, last year he did catch like 113 balls and average like 13 yards a catch. And I feel like that's so he does have a big learning curve ahead of him to see if he can be the guy to, you know, blow the top off of defense. But I think that's why he. That he'll make it on him. And Kirby, are you picking up the Deshaun cutting out, or is that just on my end? Uh, no, that's coming to me too. Uh, let's see if that clears up. But it was doing this last time too. Um, maybe I will close some programs or something. But if we're both hearing it, that's a little strange. Anyway, we're a classy uh, organization. Um, you know, one thing that I think bodes well for him was just in terms of the offense that LSU ran um, and and the need for receivers to convert routes and read coverages during like the post snap part of the play might help him acclimate a little bit faster and offset some of the you know lack of uh, being used on the outside or dealing with press coverage as we discussed last week and during the draft itself you know that I don't know. I, I'm trying to look for, I don't want to say silver linings, but I clearly wasn't a fan of the pick. I think all three of us didn't necessarily like that pick. If people didn't watch the, the, the draft stream or the show last week, a lot of that was just based on how he was used his uh, final season at LSU lining up in the slot either 98.6% of the time, or I saw another stat that it really was 99.6% of the time, like 875 out of 880 snaps. Um, and the fact that Adam Thielen is arguably the, the best uh, slot receiver in the NFL right now. Um, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, he only lined up in the slot 28.3% of the time in 2019. But that's a little more... It's disconcerting in that most of his, his deep balls... And, and yardage came from the slot, so like 50% of it did. Um, so that even though he only lined up 28% of the time, 50% of his overall production came from the slot. So I don't necessarily think that's a is that is that also taking into account the fact that they ran most of their plays out of um, two tight end with him on the outside. <laughs> So like what I'm saying is if they're running that two tight ends out set with him on the outside, it looks like he's not running out of the slot very much. But when you take into consideration that they passed with him out of the slot more than yeah. when they ran, that, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, it includes everything. Um, I get what you mean. I'm not also, I also think there's a lot of misinformation or, or expect, expectations in regards to the two tight end set and how that's going to impact the offense in in 2020 it's not necessarily a thing if you look at the stats from from kubiak's history where he had two tight ends getting significant um statistics or yardage or anything like that like that they did line up that way a lot but they still relied on the number one and the number two receiver tremendously and the number one tight end but the the second tight end didn't catch a ton of balls any time that he's he's really done that since the mid '90s, um, but uh, throwing it to you, Kirby, and I'll throw out another quote that I saw to see if you want to uh, talk about this or anything we just discussed with Jefferson. <clears throat> he came out this week and said a lot of people say I'm only a slot receiver or a lot of the things, a lot of those things, but a lot of people don't realize that I played my whole career on the side. I'm a diverse receiver who can go wherever on the field. I also found an interesting quote in writing about um, this specific topic, which was him making the team play, where he kind of at first was a, seemed a little 
Barky about the fact that he was being moved to the slot when he was being interviewed uh, before last season. And then he also said it was kind of a relief because the coverage on the outside was a, a killer. And so I thought that was interesting. Maybe it's just me um, confirmation bias. But yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts on him making the league pay his first year, um, especially on a quote unquote run first offense? Um, I think it's good from the from a mental standpoint and, and just like a mentality standpoint. Um, it, it 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 it's nice to see a guy who who's gonna come in with that fire. Um, and instead of uh some people like uh I don't know Laquan Treadwell, who as much as he was a quote unquote professional his whole career, never really seemed like he was that fired up and like that ready to go. It just seemed like he was, yeah, he was working and everything by catching balls on the jugs machine, but he never seemed to have, he never seemed to have that it, uh, like that fire. Patterson, um, either. So he always smiled regardless of what was going on. It was like, he fumbled, smiled, hundred yards, yeah. kick return for touchdown, smiled. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be, it's nice to see. That's actually both of our first round picks. I'm excited about their mentality because Gladney is, a an absolute bulldog on defense, and he's um, really fiery, uh, which can get him in trouble. But I, I think it'll be good to see that um, that out of some of the young guys. Um, but as far as his transition, um, I think he'll be okay. It's going to be you know a lot of getting up to speed um, and and figuring out how to handle the coverage in the NFL, especially on the outside. Um, especially against against guys who play really good press, um, but I, I think he'll do fine. Um, I, I'm I have concerns about it at least in his first year, um, with the fact that there's not really going to be an off season program because of yeah. um, the pandemic. Um, but I, I think it might take him a little bit of time to get up to speed, um, and he might not make teams pay in his first year. But but I think he can make the transition. Um, but it's just a question of like, how long is that going to take? And like we've said, how is that going to fit with using, using Adam Thielen effectively um, and, and trying to balance both of them out of the slot? Um, so and I don't know. I, I think is, is yeah, I, I'm is more of a slot guy than, than he was uh, an outside guy. Yeah. I, I mean, I think Osborne will see, way more time as a, as a returner than a, than a on the field as a receiver. Well, then you have like BB, you would think is more of a slot guy. Um, that brings us to Deshaun's who he thinks the, the deep threat is going to be. Let me guess Irv Smith jr. Huh? Um, <laughs> I want Irv Smith jr. To be the deep threat. I, I love Irv. Um, I think th- Thielen is still undoubtedly going to be the deep threat. Well, for some um, reason, I thought we were talking outside of Thielen. I'm being dumb, of course. Oh, outside outside of Thielen? Um, it's <laughs> nobody. Um, I guess Irv. Ezra Cleveland. Outside of Thielen. Ezra Cleveland, he'll just run straight downfield. He'll report as eligible and then just run straight can, downfield. There's nothing he can't do. Um, yeah, I really don't know outside of Thielen, to be honest. I. BC. Yeah, uh, BC doesn't quite have. I don't think BC has that kind of That's athleticism. What I was Maybe uh, Tajay Sharp. What was his? I'm I'm a little more bullish on Tajay Sharp than I think most people are. Um, I think. I mean, I don't think that's really his forte, but I think he could be a really uh, decent contribution to the offense. But Deshaun, who was who was the mystery receiver that you teed up for us? The mystery receiver was the man that you just mentioned, Mr. Tajay Sharp. Sharp. Yeah. (laughs) So I went back and, you know, I watched some additional film on some of the guys we picked up on the offseason. And the one thing I kind of noticed is that, you know, Tajay Sharp has been kind of bogged down by poor quarterback play kind of his entire career. Like Marcus Mariota was kind of decent his first year. That he came in. I think he was injured in 2017 or 2018. I don't think he played much. But if you see, if you watch Tajay Sharp, he consistently wins his battles against some of the top guys. There, I think in one season, he had successful games against Jalen Ramsey, Tredavious White, uh, who else was it? Uh, Casey Hayward from the Chargers. 
that's that's a pretty impressive list. He knows how to he knows how to get open against one on one coverage, and I think that's kind of the big point is that he will Charlie Sharp will never see double coverage on a team with Kyle Rudolph, Er Smith Jr., um, Adam Thielen, Dalvin Cook. Charlie Sharp will never see double coverage. And that just gives him a chance to use his skill set to get open deep. And he's a big guy. And he runs pretty fast, too. I mean, for a guy that's like, I want to say Tajay Sharp's like 6'3", almost 6'4", runs like a 4'5". So he know Tajay Sharp knows how to get open. He's a, yeah. he's a pretty good route runner. He's I actually, think that's the, 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 what I remember reading, reading and writing about him when he came here. He's, his routes are great. Um, he gets to his top speed really quickly um good hands the the anti digs in that he is humble and wants to get better and, and works at it not to say that digs doesn't put a tremendous amount of work in but it doesn't seem like the most humble guy at this point um so yeah i, I completely agree with you man so yeah i would say don't be surprised if you see tajay sharp kind of become the new deep guy for the vikings as everyone else kind of works the middle but yeah. uh, we'll see. also expecting a big jump from Irv Smith Jr., whose uh, target share and target depth has dropped considerably since college. But I'm expecting uh, Gary Kubiak to bring that back up for him. And he was one of your five. Uh, he was one of my five. Uh, he was, yeah, he was number two on my list um, simply because I think the Vikings didn't really know how to use him last year and i want to say they try to use him the same way they try to use kyle rudolph and their skill sets are completely different but i think gary kubiak has been he's always been great with utilizing his tight ends um owen daniels basically owes his career to gary kubiak so i think he will learn how to end i mean Irv Smith is more on the faster side. He's not the biggest guy, even though he can run after the catch a little bit, but I think he's better served running routes. I remember I wrote an article last year comparing his route running to that of Travis Kelsey, which is hard. It's it's very difficult to be a good route running tight end because if you think about it, Zach Ertz is really good at route running. You You have Darren Waller, who became really good at it. George Kittle? His routes are not great. He's just fantastic after the catch. And you have, you have other guys like Jimmy Graham who are just who's just big and um, other guys that just kind of catch over kind of catch over people. Irv Smith can't do that because he's only 6'2. So but he runs great routes. And I think he'll really be able to evolve his route tree. Also, within that article, his average target depth was less than CJ Ham, the full uh. Which is bad. Really bad. What do you so, attribute that to specifically? Like, just, again, the the way they utilized him or lack thereof? I know that Kubiak traditionally will, if he goes into a new team or has a new roster, he'll tend to use a tight end who can block and catch versus a pass catcher who can't block as well. Um, I know that Irv Smith came in and surprised everybody with his blocking ability. Kyle Rudolph was always known as the guy who that couldn't block, period. Um, he stepped up last year. Um, but do you think that maybe that was due to him being more of a um, a blocker that got the ball dumped off to him as like a safety valve sort of thing? It, yeah, I think it, I think it could have been that way. Um... And I mean, I think it's good that Kyle Rudolph finally finally bought in. I think Kyle Rudolph wasn't a great blocker because I guess he didn't really want to be. But once he once you see him fully buy in to the run first scheme and say that he's basically here to do whatever he's asked, you saw he, he actually became a pretty solid blocker. But yeah, a lot of if you look at some of the plays, a lot of the a lot of the plays were like Kirk, Kirk Cousins play action, dump it off to Irv Smith two yards in front of the line of scrimmage, or drop back and dump it off to Irv five yards in front of the line of scrimmage as like a third option. But if you look back to the Broncos game when he scored a touchdown, if you look back to the Raiders game where he killed their linebackers, he knows how to get open. And I think it's a it's a good thing to have a tight end and knows how to get open against safeties and linebackers. But the only issue is that now we go from having two guys that know how to work a middle to four with yeah. Kyle Rudolph or Smith. And we're still kind of lacking the deep speed, the four, the four, three, four, two guy, even though Thielen is a pretty solid deep threat. I mean, he knows how to get open. He can catch over people. He's just kind of savvy in that way. Not, not necessarily a deep threat, but someone that can beat you deep. But I'm not. I wouldn't really. I wouldn't. I mean, I'm not sure 
because uh, we've never asked him to to be that deep guy because we had digs, but we'll yeah. see what. And I wonder, and I'll throw this to you, Kirby. Do you think that, you know, I, the more I thought about the draft, the more I thought there's no way that what you just said, this acclamation of all these short and intermediate middle of the field type receivers was an accident or not by design um, from Kubiak. And it, and it might not seem like a typical Kubiaki in offense, at least it was, we remember his most recent time in Denver. Um, but do you think that that's what the team might be looking to do? And, and if so, for what reason? I mean, there were a lot of receivers they could have taken in the second round. They could have gone the Mims route or, or at least somebody who uh, can can stretch the field a little bit. It just seemed like, you know, they, they haven't done that. I'm sorry. Can you re-ask? It would, like, shorten that question down. I've missed part of okay. it. I've also got a child running around. Um, yeah, it, I was just wondering with the, the amount of – Slot guys, short, intermediate guys that they've picked up. Do you think that that is a sign for maybe a deviation in 2020, that that's what they wanted to do as opposed to that's how things ended up going in the draft or free agency? I think certainly it's um, it, it's obviously by design in the draft. Um, free agency is kind of hard to say because um, th- there's just not you know there's the there's not necessary they didn't necessarily have the flexibility to move around and and grab um, the guys they wanted they got Tajay Sharp at like a, a crazy discount for um, a, a veteran receiver um, and anybody else that would be available it would have costed them an arm and a leg um, and there really wasn't anybody available although Antonio Brown is still out there so maybe. Ooh. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Alive. Um, but yeah, I, I think in the draft, you certainly could have been targeting more deep threat guys, especially when you hit the KJ Osborne pick in the fifth, like you could have been stacking just guys who are maybe not the best technique wise, but have that burner speed, um, and have that, you know, prototype and you could have coached them up. Um, but I think it's it's really hard, I, I think, to fault them for getting guys who are supposedly going to be good at, at technique and the a short and intermediate routes because that's like your bread and butter, right? That's like how you get first downs. But you also need to be able to stretch the field. And I, I agree that Thielen can do it. Um, I just question if you're sending Thielen deep on every single you know, play how much his production is going to fall off and what you're going to do. Um, I, I think there's a lot of question marks is, is what this boils down to with the fact that they don't really have an archetype outside of the short to intermediate middle of the field guys, um, except for Thielen and maybe Tajay Sharp, who are both kind of more do it all guys. Yeah, it, it does feel more zimmer than kubiak to me. I know Zimmer would be happy winning every game 6-3 to three if he could, and so maybe that's just something they're doing by design, slowing the game down a little bit, dinking and dunking here and there, you know. Um, I guess we'll see. Apparently, um, you know, I really thought after the draft that we would eventually hear a vote of confidence in, for Pat Elfline from... Uh, Zimmer or Spielman and they came out <clears throat> Spielman came out this week and essentially said that the guard position is how did he put it like an open content wide open um, he, he said we're excited about Bradbury O'Neill and Riley Reef holding down the fort on the left side until we see what we have but it's going to be a wide open competition at the interior spot the two guard spots um, that kind of ties into uh, Ezra Cleveland a little bit, and we're hearing a lot. Um, I don't know how much is actually substantiated or linked to anything from the team, but a lot of people talking about um, 
moving him to guard. I thought there was there was something the team had said about being flexible, but I couldn't find an actual source for that before the show, so I don't know why I'm mentioning it now. Um, no, I, th- I thought I read something as well about Spielman saying that um, Cleveland could possibly be a jack-of-all-trades guy that they slide around. Yeah, um, that, yeah I, think draft right. night, I think draft night Spielman said it, and I think a couple of days ago Kubiak also said it, but I think Kubiak was more specific and said that he think he's going to try Cleveland at guard first year. I think he kind of gave Riley Reef the vote of confidence that he's going to be the starter at left tackle and that if Ezra Cleveland is going to play, it's going to be at a guard position. How do you guys feel about that? So, yeah. so I wrote also, I put Ezra Cleveland in my top five of guys that could have a breakout year. And I think, so I, on his film session, I, I was outright saying that Ezra Cleveland is coming in as a better run blocker than probably anybody on our offensive line as of right now in, in terms of a zone system. So he could slide into guard and be okay run blocking wise. Now, his only thing is going up against these 300-pounders who move at, like, the speed of light on the inside. So I can see him kind of struggling there. But he did put up 30 on the bench press. So it's not like he's a weakling. It's just more, um, I guess, kind of solidifying that anchor. Because the difference is you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about speed rush. The best a guy on the inside can do in terms of speed rush is cut across your face. Which, I mean, it's a kind of an easier thing to stop. So play, a guard is definitely much easier. It should give him up to speed on the NFL game before he kicks out the tackle. So I can see it working. Usually when guys move into guard, their number one issue is run blocking and dealing with the strength on the inside. But I think Ezra Cleveland is set up to do relatively well on those two. And I actually went out to say that I said it can either have a Mike Rimmers effect on his career, unfortunately, or Ezra Cleveland can come out on this season as a potential Pro Bowl pick. Yeah, I wonder, I was, that was going to be the second part to the question, is do you worry about how that might impact his development or like even a TJ Clemmings effect, which is should terrify every Vikings fan with an earshot. Um, you know, I think it would be a, I mean, logic, you think would dictate that, Putting him at guard would acclimate him before, like you said, kicking him to the more difficult position that has just a, a lot more responsibility and, and different looks that, that he, he's going to have to deal with. Um, I think it would make more sense. I mean, I don't know where you guys or how you feel about Riley Reef. I think a lot of people have a really negative um, connotation with him. I think his his PFF numbers are a lot better than I think people – from an eye test perspective would would think and so uh, if you could put somebody that's is much of an athletic freak as is cleveland is next to him as opposed to the black hole that was elf line or uh compton before him i say go for it i mean it's better than moving reef to guard a position he hasn't played i think since his the start of his sophomore year in at iowa um or flipping brian o'neill over there and putting some mix of reef and cleveland on the other side i mean we'll see i mean he does struggle a little little bit against the the power or this how do they put it the the, not the power rush but the speed to power rush and so it'd be interesting to see how he deals with um, dts on the inside but i mean again like you said he's he's big he's extremely athletic the if he can block uh in the run game anywhere near what he did um in college that I say go for it. Yeah, I don't think there's... I I think there's no... (laughs) I'm fine with Riley Reef personally. Um, I'm in the camp that he's serviceable. Um, Obviously, I would rather have someone who's better, but you can get by with him as long as you have a decent guard on that side, um, which Pat Elfline is not. Um, It never has been. Um... So I think moving Cleveland in um, as as a young guy, I think he's definitely got the potential to grow at that position, um, and then also learn uh, as an understudy to Riley Reef because Riley Reef is a I think he's a very good like actual um, leader and and he knows his technique and he knows how to 
um, and, and he'll be able to help like the young guy, but I don't think he's great at, at putting that into effect um, on the field. Um, and like I said, if you put a decent guard next to him, I think he'll do a lot better than trying to get his guy, but also have his uh, have it the right corner of his eye open to look and see if Elfline's getting destroyed and if he needs to dive in front of Kirk Cousins to save him. Um, so I think it's a really good move to move uh, to you know move Cleveland to the inside while also teaching him the tackle position because uh, not only does it work for this year, um, you, you know, getting hopefully a better guard. Um, but it, it just gives you a really good option in the future to move him back to tackle yeah. um, and have that experience and, and up to speed on the NFL game um, while also learning his technique. Yeah, it creates something that we haven't had or a word that we almost forgot because it's been so long, but depth. You know, moving him in, then you would have Udo, you would have Samia, um, Brett Jones, who, who I don't know why we don't hear his name more often, as bad as things have been. He's kind of a flex guy, I get that, but he, I mean, especially in, in 2018, he couldn't have been worse than what Tom Compton was doing. I, I, I can't imagine anyone would be. Um, and then if they bring back Klein something that I think his agent said anything was possible in that regard, um, you might have, again, depth or um, at least not such an apocalyptic scenario should somebody get hurt and then you end up in the situation that we've been in. I, I Traditionally, I mean, my frustration has been in regards to the Vikings continually shuffling guys around that ne- haven't necessarily played guard um at least in the pros or ever which was remmer's case and i felt you know if they just invested a little bit more in the position via the draft um that could change things but again my i think my outlook on the draft would be completely different if they did move cleveland to guard and then he was able to contribute that way i mean that's kind of a hindsighty thing but you know, that, again, that's just been my, my biggest frustration is essentially the, the line is, is worse off right now than it was at the end of last year because Klein is gone. He was um, at least statistically a, a good um, impact. It had a good Im- impact on the offense. Um, one last thing is that the will they, won't they, Everson Griffin stuff uh, came out again last night, and uh, he's been linked to a lot of uh, actually contending teams in the NFC. So I could see the Vikings not wanting him to go to Seattle or Dallas or any of those teams that his name keeps popping up with. Um, I love Everson Griffin. I think that he has a lot of gas left in the tank. I think that a lot of people are forgetting what happened um, the season before last and how that impacted his numbers. I just rewatched some of the highlights from the Minneapolis Miracle game, and first things first, it is the Minneapolis Miracle. Paul Allen said it both before and after that play. That's why it was coined. Um, I get so many when I post shirts with Minneapolis Miracle. I guess that's like the number one thing people comment on. To just seeing how quickly he got off the ball, it's it, it's almost uh, ESP like the, how quickly. I, I watched one at like uh, 0.5 speed on YouTube, but it's just like, man, he's so quick. Um, again, I think he has a lot left in the tank. I think with the youth that they now have on this defense, an argument that I think Deshaun tying it into that uh, Twitter, people saying a, a young defense is better than an established defense, or you can explain that better um, than I can. Um, but he was a leader in the locker room, and I think it would be amazing if they were if they were able to bring him back. Yeah, um, I, yeah, Everson just, he was a great player in several facets of the game, and I think it, bringing him back would be good if we're able to keep him for more than one year, because I don't think the defense is quite ready yet to make a, like, a Super Bowl run now, because the thing, what people forget is that, of course, No, Wayne's Rhodes, they weren't great last season. But what they didn't do was give up big plays every single game. Now, there were their first fair share of games. Like, you know, against Seattle, they gave up like a 50 yard touchdown. Um, Against Dallas, they gave up like a 30 or 40 yard touchdown. 
and then I guess of course gets the Chiefs. They give up like that ninety yard touchdown, but those plays are few and far in between. And actually, on a on the site, I can't remember what the site was. Uh, defensive big play percentage. They have the Vikings in the run. I want to say was not seventh in the NFL, and against the pass, they were ninth. Now you wouldn't know that because of how bad people say our defense is. Now that number, no matter how good Dantzler and Gladney are, that number is going to go up. Because they're rookies. I mean, half the battle as a rookie is learning the offense. It's really not – It's. I mean, it's about being able to cover guys, but it's knowing what the offensive coordinator is going to throw at you. These guys are genius. They know how to get their guys open regardless of who it is. So that's half the battle. They're going to give up good plays. As rookies, it's just what happens. And – the defense is going to be worse off, of course. You lose that many vets, of course, it's going to be worse off. But maybe bringing Everson back and knowing you're getting a – I mean, Odenabo had, had seven sacks last year, but he only played about 40 30% of the snaps. So bringing back a guy who played like 60 65 and you're getting like guaranteed pass rush and know what you're getting out of him, it could elevate the defense enough to where if the Vikings don't go like 7-9 and nine or 8-8. Eight eight. Yeah, Losing Linval is going to be a big blow to um, pun intended, I think. Uh, I just can't imagine. I mean, we've all seen how long it takes corners to acclimate to Zimmer's system. Rhodes was already well on his way to, to becoming the, the one or two season all pro level guy that he was. Before Zimmer got here, he showed some promise and then he kind of took a step back and then it took him a while to acclimate Trey Wayne's the same thing I think it took two or three seasons for that I think it's just in completely unrealistic I mean I, I some of the guys on slack were talking about the Vikings going nine and seven and every year's different every schedule's different but I can't looking at the roster that they had last year or 2018 when they went eight seven and one and then uh, ten and six them being one game worse than that with all the youth that they have, I think is unrealistic. I think Zimmer's goal, um, I don't think it was as manipulative as this is going to sound. Um, cause, cause I'm just going to say it quickly, but um, it, with Spielman 2, both going into their contract year, saying let's get, you know, they could either have kept one or two guys around and tried for another run in 2020, or they could have scrapped it, amassed as much cap space and draft picks, and then put together a, a young core, especially on defense, to go to the Wills and say, we deserve a second chance at, at, at going for the, the brass ring or whatever. Um, I, I think that's what they did. I think that was the right decision to have made. I uh, clearly am kind of out in left field on how I felt about the draft as a whole, but... Um, that doesn't mean that I, I think some of these guys are bad picks. I, I just think that some of them were, and then they've ignored a position that I've talked about at Nazium, so I won't go into it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't expect them to, to do much this season. I don't think most people should. But they are set up. They are set up very nicely for 2021. They're already coming in with, what, three fourth-round draft picks, two-thirds they're expecting. 12 picks. And- Overall, I think Spielman said already, already, which is kind of crazy. And then they're also going in with, as of right now, I think it, they're set at about forty million in cap space for next season. Now you have to subtract Cook's contract because it looks like we didn't draft any running backs, so it looks like Cook is going to be paid. Uh, still waiting to see what that number is going to be like. Um, I'm not sure if Brian O'Neill is a free agent next. I think 2021 might be his last. 2018, 2019, 2021 would be the fourth, and then they could exercise the fifth year, I think. Right. So, um, we'll prob- they'll probably want to extend him before that, <laughs> but maybe next offseason. But uh, the way they do their contracts, usually the year they extend you, your money doesn't really go up, so it kind of saves them against the cap. So, they- in 2021, with the experience that some of these corners will gain, they won't have many holes left. If you really think about it, I mean, obviously they feel strongly about Armand Lotz. So who knows if he'll be a starter? We still have Jane Lynch. We'll see if he is a starter. Troy Dye, I um I did his film thread and I originally say that I felt Troy Dye was a replacement for Jaron Curse. Kind of turned feel a little bit. And I think Troy Dye is a replacement for Anthony Barr. I think their their play style, the way they penetrate, the way they cover is extremely similar. So I think if Troy Dye pans out, I think the Vikings try to find a way out of Anthony Barr's contract 
a tad bit earlier, depending on how it's set up. Did you oh. see his quote about Barr dies? I did not. What he said? Okay, so essentially he said uh, during the scouting combine, um, his favorite NFL linebackers to watch. He said it was uh, Barr because they're both from California. He said he wanted to learn how Barr transitioned from a three-four edge rusher to an outside linebacker uh, because of his size and him having to essentially move to a different position. Um, the, and then the quote was, "I'm going to be able to pick his brain and really get to know what he does and why he does it." Because he was a transition guy in college like I was. So I think that's a really good fit, even though that's kind of like uh, a little awkward, like a Favre to Rogers situation, Rogers. Is what you're saying. Right. Or, yeah, Rogers to uh, what's his face? So, um, yeah, yeah, seeing the way, I mean, of course, Die has some things to clean up, but he's a good penetrator on blitzes. He covers backers probably a lot better than Anthony Barr already does. So they have this foundation in place to be big players in free agency next year to get pieces like Joe Thune, because Joe Thune is still on this franchise tag contract, and there's no guarantee that they're going to spend $12 million to extend their guard when they don't even have a quarterback of the future yet. So, Thune is still an option for next year. Um, the guy from the Redskins, the guard, Brandon Sheriff, is still an option next year. So, the Vikings, they've really set themselves up well to be big players in 2021. And I think that's the season. And I and looking at this draft, that's kind of what you see. They went defensive a lot to get these guys a year to be acclimated because 2021 is kind of where the real games start and where they really start to play for their Super Bowl. I think Thune went to the – didn't he go to NC State like Bradbury? We'd have – I think they're, they didn't play next to each other, but that'd be a kind of a weird thing. Um I think that I mean what you're. I see what you're saying, but I think that that uh, assumes that that there are these guys. Um, I guess we by that point we won't really know who's a bust and who isn't. So that's like you know. Um, I was gonna say that it assumes a lot of these guys end up panning out. Um, right. Like as we've seen, you know, as much as I give, um, as much chagrin as I give to. Spielman and Zimmer, they have had a tremendous run in regards to drafting or identifying drafting and developing defensive talent. I mean, it's been astounding, especially early in the draft. Um, their hit rate is is insane. I mean, outside of like Sheree Floyd, which was just a freak medical injury, I mean, the, the pick after pick has worked out on some level. There haven't been a lot of big busts that they've taken if any that i can think of on defense really um in the first second or first or second round um and so there's that um they they owe andre patterson a race i'm just gonna put that out there <laughs> andre, yeah. andre patterson deserves a race a very big one oh, <laughs> but I, he actually got one. Got, he, I think he got one co-defensive coordinator uh the things that andre patterson do with draft picks is just absolutely like insane. You don't see it anywhere else. Um, I was just thinking about it because I saw the news that um, Taco Charlton was cut from the Cowboys and then the Dolphins. So uh, it's you can see how hard it is to actually develop these guys. So for and these these are like first round pick guys that aren't panning out for other teams. So to see Patterson, because I think what Everson Griffin was a fourth round pick. I think Daniel Hunter was like a third or a fourth. Uh, Brian Robinson was he early? I'm not entirely sure if he was. Early. So. was a, he was either a seventh rounder or undrafted. Yeah, which is and Odenabo I think was a seventh rounder. Redley was a seventh rounder. Oh, I think no. we, we are like spoiled by Andre Patterson. That the the job that he does with defensive linemen is just absolutely insane. Like insane. The fact that somebody doesn't want to make him their defensive coordinator has boggled my mind. Because he is just like, we might be witnessing one of the, uh, I don't want to go too far, but we might be witnessing one of the greatest defensive line, you know, coaches when it comes to developing talent in a long time. Like, I'm I'm probably going to do research on this, and maybe I might even make an article out of it, but his track record has to be up there with some of the greats. It just has to be. There's no way. It's surprising, like you said, though, that with the success this defense has had, that we've seen more 
guys on the offense of the ball from a coaching or a coordinating perspective get offers or take offers than on the defensive side of the ball. And I wonder if that's because these guys have been together for a decent, well, not that long. I mean, it's not like Zimmer's been a head coach forever. Um, but maybe they just have that loyalty loyalty to one another. Or uh, Zimmer drives by their house at night with his lights on <laughs> and just creeps everybody out. But you think it would be the other way around, not Stefanski getting a head coaching job, but, you know. The, the younger Zimmer or George Edwards or Patterson, like you're saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a, who knows what goes into the decision of making some of these guys coaches. Cause there was a couple of head scratchers this year. Uh, Stefanski was a tad bit of a head scratcher. Yeah, I mean, I kind of get it. They wanted to pair him with Baker Mayfield instead of a defensive coach. So I kind of get it. Yeah. Uh, where it's, I think, where did, did Edwards end up in Dallas or where yeah. did he? He's in yeah. Dallas. Oh, yeah, but Edwards is great, so I kind of I understand that one. Edwards has been very good here, so that one I understand. Um, uh, Joe Judge to the Giants was kind of like a weird one. I didn't understand that, that one much. Um, so who knows really, really goes into the to the process of picking these coaches. I just know that uh, Patterson's time should be coming relatively soon. If not, we'd love to keep them to continue to develop these guys that probably shouldn't have a shot in the NFL. I know. We should probably shouldn't say these things publicly um uh the the other uh potential breakout player on your article that we haven't talked about you have justin jefferson tajay sharp or the junior is garrett bradbury and i wanted um kirby's take and i know kirby's gotta hop off in about five minutes um on garrett bradbury that was actually your number one pick uh, God, I'm classy. I'm like pointing with a cigarette. <laughs> uh, um, what your thoughts are were on Bradbury's um, rookie season and and moving forward? If you just in general, if... um, yeah, I feel super super confident in Garrett Bradbury, um, especially in the current scheme we're in in the zone blocking scheme. Um, I think there was times where both on film, um, if you didn't look close enough, and on the PFF grades where he got screwed um, because of Pat Elfline next to him. Yeah. Um, he, he got a lot of credit for bad things that I think were actually Elfline's fault. Um, I, I know if you watch back um, plenty of the film and you keep an eye on him, he does occasionally make the wrong read, um, and, he, and he makes the wrong call at the line. Um, and that that would allow a free runner every once in a while, um, but that's that's just a matter of you know getting acclimated to the NFL and and you know um, running through those things in your mind. And I think that will get better with time and and experience. Um, so I'm super confident in, in Bradbury getting better. I think the only you know concern that I really have is injury at this point um, that will derail him. Um, I, I don't know that he'll ever hit like an all pro level as a center, but I think he'll be very, very solid uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, and that's about all you need in my mind out of a center. Um, you, you know, you don't necessarily need an all pro center if you have a, a pretty good line around him. Um, and hopefully some of the picks we made this year and Samia um, will cement the inside spots around him and, and really let him thrive and shine. Yeah, I the, you know centers aren't taken in the first round very often, and especially not at 18. Um, a lot of the ones that have been since the year 2000 have turned out to be really, really good Hall of Fame type players. Um, that doesn't mean anything really, but it just it should tell you how high the Vikings were on him, and perhaps the ability to move Alf line to guard and improve two positions at once, which clearly worked out great. Um, Sami was another, speaking of head scratchers, I, 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 I guess he was more projecty than I had read or thought he was going to be. I always thought that he would fill in for Klein after, you know, seven, eight games, um, coming off of, you know, playing for the best line in college and at Oklahoma. Um, but he was again, named by Spielman and they, he said that the coaches were very, very high on him right now. So we could very well see. Um, him that could be why they didn't really go uh, guard anywhere in the fourth, fifth, or third, fourth, or fifth round. Um, but yeah, Deshaun, you wrote the article, so what? What? Uh, why did you put Brad, Bradbury at number one? 
So I put Bradbury at number one because his breakout season kind of started before the season ended. So if you look at some of his PFF stats, um, so first off, I want to say his PFF stats are pretty bad because he's not great with penalties. He had eight penalties last year, which I think was fourth or fifth among centers in the NFL. But um, so in his first four weeks, as we remember uh, his 0.0 against the Falcons and uh Grady Jarrett, despite the Vikings blowing the Falcons out in that game. Um, He gave up like 11 pressures and like I think a sack within his first four games. But after those four games, from week five to week 15, he gave up eight pressures, no sacks. And that was it. And that's that's a huge jump for a rookie to go 10 weeks. I mean, regardless of who you're playing, to go 10 weeks with only eight pressures, that's like, that's Pro Bowl level play, really. So... He was already kind of there, and then he went and played the he played the Packers week sixteen last year, and we kind of know what happened there. Um, but besides besides that one blip week sixteen against the Packers, where I feel like the entire offensive line fell apart, it was just it was just bad. I feel like the game plan was the game plan was bad, the execution was bad. Everybody had a bad day that day. So if you were to take week sixteen out and just average it into his numbers. He is in line with guys like Travis Frederick, Alex Mack, Marquise Pouncey, uh, just these guys that were former pro bowlers. And that's just something that's really exciting to see from your rookie who started off kind of rough. So that's why I have Bradbury at number one, because he was kind of already on his way to being the breakout guy on the line, beside, despite week 16. Against the 49ers, he only posted three pressures, despite being also tire line being destroyed in that game um, against the Saints. He didn't post any pressures at all. He had a great game, although his run blocking wasn't great, even though the Saints were like the number one or number two run defense in the NFL. So the blocking weren't, we weren't really expecting it to be great, but his pass protection was phenomenal against the Saints line. And he did, we did falter against the 49ers a little bit, but that's expected against elite teams. So he was on his way to already having a breakout season before the season ended. So I'm kind of expecting that to continue into 2020. Me too. Um, Kirby, I know you have to go. So uh, we'll catch up with you next week and people can uh, hop on Vikings territory, purple PTSD uh, this week as well. And uh, check out your stuff. Yep. I'll be back with some stuff, some film analysis I've been watching. Um, watching last year's games um and i've got some interesting formation analysis so that should be a good one to look forward to i wonder if you hop off if the video will cut off for everybody um i can leave it just uh running and streaming and i'll just turn i'll just mute myself and then when you guys get done you can just uh text me okay okay thanks man see ya later um, but yeah, back to what you were saying, I, I completely agree with you. I think, you know, it's as much as PFF is getting better and better at what they're, what they do and what their algorithms do. Um, it's not as an exact science from, from one position to the next, especially on the line as, as dependent as those guys are on the guys next to them more so than I think anywhere else on the field. Um, but he did struggle to start out. I think that was, was a surprise. Um, but there's no better ironically situation for these young guys to, to come into than what, um, the Vikings have with Kubiak and Dennison. And then they went out and they, they got another guy to look at the offensive line. And I think his name's like Phil Rauscher, who uh, was with cousins in Washington um, and so, you know, we'll see. I, I think Dennison, um, speaking of guys who don't really get larger opportunities, perhaps just because of their loyalty to the guys around them, he's mm-hmm. been, you know, known as like a, the new Mike Tice or that, I mean, not new, he's an older guy, but he's uh, kind of a offensive line guru and I have more faith in him than I do really anyone that's been here since Tice including Tony Sperano so hopefully um, 
I don't know. I really, I just, to be honest, man, I would feel so much better if they just brought Klein back. Even if, you know, even if they're high on Samia or Udo or whatever, I just think that there was a, a, a distinct difference between the games that he played in and the games that he didn't. Um, you know, I read out some of the stats that I, I talked about in my uh, part two of my article about the draft and the, the precipitous drop off that. Uh, Dalvin Cook had in his uh, average yards per attempt when Klein missed the three games that he did. I think O'Neal is stronger with Klein next to him. Um, and again, just it just feels like whenever we get close to any semblance of depth on this line, we lose it right away, especially on the interior. Like, I, I, I think getting rid of Klein, getting rid of Alex Boone, which I know he came in overweight, wasn't a very an abrasive guy personality-wise, but they knew that before they brought him in Sprano liked those kind of guys he he they actually used that as a selling point to the fan base saying like his style was the, the Mahler type guy that Sprano liked and then all of a sudden that became an issue you know a year later um I just don't think they I don't know I, I don't think they see why they should pay to have a deep offensive line you know it's not like the on the other side of the ball you know Zimmer and and company really love to keep their defensive linemen fresh and they cycle guys in and out and that's not something you do on, on an offensive line so I think they play with fire a lot and expect guys not to get injured and then you end up with like a 2016 situation where everybody got injured or the situation that we've we found ourselves in I hate being this repetitive especially since this is only our second episode, but it's just, it's incredibly important to have a good offensive line. We've seen what Cousins can do when he has time, and I think that they're not necessarily in the position right now where things are hopeless by any means. Bring Klein back, move um, Cleveland to guard, or see what Samia can do or Udo can do or whatever. I mean, I think that would be better than what they had last year just because the way that Alfline played but I, I yeah again I'm I, I just would feel a lot better if Klein was here <laughs> love you Josh um call me um uh, what else did we, oh yeah so I know Kirby hated the Nate Stanley pick um I wanted to tease him a little bit um as if I never have bad takes um, apparently they drafted him because there were like three other teams that were interested in him. And I don't know if you, uh, in looking at the second half of the draft, if you looked into, into his career at all at Iowa, I am always, as you will discover, um, going to bring up the big 10, at least once an episode. And I'm always just extremely biased towards big 10 players. I like the big 10. I like how they do things. I like, you know, I think they run a, a more, pro style uh, type of offense with the offensive line. The SEC does too, but you know, just bigger, beefier offensive linemen. Um, there, I like the academic standards that they have. I think that ingrains are worth ethic, ethic in some of these guys, as, uh, not just the ones that aren't cheating anyway. Um, and so I, I like that pick. I mean, it, it's a seventh round pick. It's not the end of the world. We knew that at some point Spielman was going to take a flyer on a developmental quarterback. That's what he does. And um, I guess he has a, a pretty big arm from what I understand. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to like break down his play, though. So I guess I'm kind of biased when I had other guys like Anthony Gordon, who I did look at, um, and Cole McDonald, who I also looked at. Um, so I, I haven't had a chance, but I did see that he never completed – he never reached 60% completion Good. with passes. That's and I'm not, I think I've seen that on Twitter. Not entirely sure if it's true, but I think, I think I looked it up and I think it is true. He never reached 60%, which is kind of like the, the universal number to, for like a viable quarterback. You always want to at least be above 60. I think when, whenever you get down to like 61 or 62, that's like, Josh Allen range, and that's just like not where you want to be in terms of your completion percentage. Like sixty-five is kind of like the cutoff between good and bad. So of course he has. I'm not sure what his team was like, who his receivers were, if his O line was good. I know he played with Tristan Wirfs, so O line must have been relatively solid. So 
We'll have to. I'll have to go and see yeah, whether it was just. They, they had those two super dope tight ends too last year, right? They did. Yeah, they had Fan and Hawkinson, right? Yeah. So you would think that that would trend towards uh, or lend itself rather to more a higher completion percentage. So right. you could be right. I mean, I I the only game I really saw him play was um, when they beat the Gophers um, last year, and it, it it pissed me off. Um, that's something yeah. we haven't talked about though. Um, he, I think well, I'm looking at it now. He was 14 to 23 for 173 and two touchdowns in that game. But what did you think of Tyler Johnson? And you know, he he seems like a very prototypical possession guy, right? Like he doesn't have a lot of speed, but he he does make big plays um, from a physicality standpoint. Um, relatively good at yards after the catch. Is he. Um, I'm not saying he's on the same level as level as Justin Jefferson, but it just seems like if they're going to have these guys that are going to be clogging up the middle and not necessarily stretching the field, why not go take that guy? At least instead of a guy like Osborne. Uh, so I just looked this up for Stanley. Um, so apparently his adjusted completion percentage is 69%, Ooh. but it's Actual completion percentage never hits 60. What so for adjusted... The, yeah, what does that mean? For adjusted, I believe they like take drop out... Or uh, yeah, throwing drops, the ball away? Yeah, drops, throwing the ball away, and spikes. Which is crazy that that would account for an entire yeah. percent of his... So maybe his receivers weren't great and they were dropping a lot of passes or he was throwing a lot of passes away maybe, but 10% is a lot. Like a lot, a lot, but... Or to... they're just spiking the ball all the time. It's like this, oh, yeah, the new it's... Wildcat, the victory <laughs> formation in the first quarter. Dude, you got to do it. Even though that's not really spiking the ball. You get what I mean. Um, we didn't – well, we talked about Troy Dye. Um, another corner that isn't getting as much shine as, as Dantzler or Gladney is Harrison Hand from Temple. Um, Vikings.com gave – that pick a B minus. It's funny they're grading their own picks that way on their own website. I find that kind of strange. <laughs> um, Troy Dye got an A uh, from whoever wrote this article. Uh, it probably doesn't work there anymore. Uh, but Harrison Hand, um, B minus pick. And then the next one was KJ Osborne out of Miami, which we kind of talked about. We can get into that a little bit more as well. Um, but what was your take on Hand? Uh, it's I don't really have one. I didn't watch him much either. But um, I've seen some people saying that they might switch him over to safety. Mm. But I, I haven't watched enough of his, of his game to really know, per se, of what he brings to the table. I just know he I think he's a bigger corner, and he ran that's, like a 4-5. Yep. And that's he's all I the length, you know, every day I was talking about Zimmer's prototypical guys, and it's a length thing, and yeah. I don't think, what is Gladney, like 5'10"? Um, yeah, but I think and, some, some someone say he has, like, really long arms for a 5'10 guy. Yeah, like Black Panther. There's that scene in Endgame where he, spoiler alert, comes through the portal at the end. Next time you guys watch that, before the big fight when Captain America's shield is broken in half, yeah, the first his, person that walks through is Black Panther, and then Shuri, and then that, um the lady, the his head bodyguard, his arms, probably because of the claw prosthetics, seriously are, like, down past his knees. It's insane. It'll be <laughs> the entire movie for it. Um, it's like that guy at Family Guy that can tickle people in the bottom of the well. Um, yeah, Zimmer likes, obviously, we knew he was going to go hard with, with corners. I think I was a little surprised with three corners and two safeties, more so the safety situation just because they have franchise even though the last time i checked he had signed the franchise tender um in anthony harris and obviously um harrison smith is still doing his thing uh but kj osborne though i think i don't know considering the value you could have still gotten with other players or with interior linemen at, at 176 if he primarily ends up returning punts or kicks that's a little disappointing to me um amir abdullah just got re-signed he's relatively good at that um i mean 
there is a huge void uh, that that was lost when Cheryl's left. I think people took him for granted. He's probably the best punt returner this team's ever had for a team that's predicated on field position and and whatnot. Uh, him always turning nothing into something ten yards here, where other guys would have maybe you know fair caught this. Um, maybe that's what Osborne can do. It looks like he was relatively good at it in college. Yeah, um, I think I, I I did I did watch a little bit of Osborne. Um, I don't think he's as much as a slot guy as I was led out to believe at first. He did play a fair amount on the outside in college, so I think he's capable of yeah, doing he was that. He's a slot guy at Buffalo, and then he played on the outside at Miami, which you think would lend itself since it's a bigger program to him being more of an outside guy. But a lot right. of the stuff I read said that Buffalo had it right more so than Miami did. He's not that big either. I think he's like right. five ten. Um, but I think the one thing that was missing, he did run like a four four eight, I believe, but you didn't really see the breakaway speed on his punt returns. A lot of his punt returns, he was caught on a lot of them. He I mean he would come out he would gain a pretty solid amount, 25, 30 yards here, which is basically flips field position. But um I he might not have the home run speed to be the kick return guy, really. But, well, I mean, it is what he's being brought in to, to do. I can honestly see Emil Abdullah, Amir Abdullah not making it through camp because we already have three rush three rushers on a team that we like. But Amir Abdullah was also really good as a gunner on punt return and tackling on kick return. So unless KJ can do that too, I can see them being reluctant to let go of Amir because he was almost a pro bowler as a special teams guy. So we'll see. And that's, uh, that's really hard to replace. Um, special teams is not something you want to be bad at because it can, you can, it can flip a game so fast and it's just not, it's a bad way to lose, to lose to like a kickoff return or a punt, punt return. Big time. Um, do you, do you look into Blake Brandel from Oregon state at all? That was a D plus according to, uh, Horn was the C plus. Uh, Brandel was a D plus according to Vikings.com. Again, these aren't my my ratings. Um, surprisingly, since uh, yeah, people know how I feel. Um, you know, my whole thing about and I keep bringing the line back up, but since he's a tackle, I'll talk about it. Is that as we talked about earlier, there have been guys taken later in in the draft for on the defensive side of the ball that the Vikings have gotten a lot more value out of than they have taking. You know, there was a five year period from 2012 until uh, Pat Alfline where the Vikings didn't take an offensive lineman before the fourth round um, of the draft. Then then Alfline was a third. Then the next year, Brian O'Neill was a second. Uh, Garrett Bradbury was the first first round pick they used on the position since Matt Khalil, which I think, as the biggest pick in in team history, um, franchise history, maybe stung um, Spielman a little bit. The fourth overall pick could have been higher, um, if not for Joe Webb. Um, but we've just seen guys like, you know, David Yankee and others that that were taken in the sixth or seventh round that maybe made the practice squad for a year. Willie Beavers, Beavers was, I think, was, even though he was a fourth rounder, was on the practice squad for a year. So, again, their their ability to identify offensive line talent late, or at least develop it, has been bad. Then again, a lot of that predated, again, Dennison, Rauscher, and Kubiak. So maybe this will be a little different. Um, I don't know if Brandel is going to end up practicing as a tackle, or maybe he'll be moved inside to guard. I don't know what his stats are. Like, I think he's going to move him into guard, I think. But that would make, I think that makes, if he moves into guard, I think that makes four or five converted tackles playing guard now for Vikings. Because there's Ezra Cleveland, there's Avante Collins, there's Blake Brandle, and then the undrafted guy, Kyle Henson. Oh, no, the seventh round pick, Kyle Henson, who also played tackle, who's now moving in to guard. And if you count Mike Rimmers, that's five in the last, like, three or four years. That's the whole thing, man. That's that's my gripe. Like, just draft one. You don't need to use – outside of the 2018 draft where there were, like, four uh, guards taken between the Hughes pick and the O'Neal pick in the 30s, going through these drafts, there, 
guards obviously aren't taken that high anymore. Back in the day, they were all the time. Number one overall pick in, like, 1969 was a guard. Um, one of those years. Um, but it doesn't take a gigantic investment um, for the team to do this. I mean, you could – there's a lot of guys at four – or in the fourth round. How many fourth round picks do we have? Three? Two? Uh, I think we had two, and we traded one out. Um, or we had – no, no, we had we had three because we drafted I want him and Lynch. Mm-hmm. So that's I mean again, it just seems like Zimmer is kind of like a kid in a candy store who sees all these shiny defensive picks and kind of prioritizes the defense over the offense. And a lot of people are saying, well, the defense had a lot of holes on it, and it's like okay, but there's, you know, I looked at all the first and second round pick picks Zimmer's has has made as a head coach for the Vikings. There's been twelve. Four of them have been corners. So a third of the time, he's taken a corner in the first or second round. And that, for a position that has two starters, arguably three with what's going on with the nickel versus, again, the interior line. There's two starters as well, but a, a five-person unit. It just, every time someone says, well, they took this guy or that, that guy, they all are all tackles. That And there's a lot of that. Um, I, I get that especially with the state of spread offenses and smaller offensive linemen in, in the NCAA. But I don't know. I, Brandle is huge, though. I think he's like 6'7", almost 6'8". So he would be a monster <laughs> at guard. That would be uh, kind of fun to watch. Um, I think the other guy they took you alluded to, uh, was that Hinton, the, the guy yeah, from Washburn? Yeah. yeah. Where is Washburn? What is that? that? I was like, what? That's a I high can't... school in Minneapolis, so it was... Um... I think it's like Carolina, maybe. I'm not sure at all. Like, not one bit. I've never even heard of it before. I am... You know, uh, here's my thing, and this is a very simplistic and stupid take. I get it. Or just simplistic. It's not stupid. But, you know, Spielman and his family, his brother are connected to Ohio State. His son um, played at Nebraska, where you are adjacent to Wisconsin, which is essentially the Penn State of offensive linemen. Multiple years in the last, like, four years, all five of their linemen have been drafted relatively early in the draft, like before the fourth round. They just churn out these amazing linemen, and maybe those guys aren't conducive with what the Vikings are trying to do from an, an athleticism standpoint, or maybe that's the stigma. You know, they I I know they would rather have athleticism and and speed, I guess, than just size and strength. Um, but that having been said, it's it's just that's the Big Ten's biggest jam is offensive linemen. Like that's what they're known for, and it just seems to me to be frustrating that even apparently had the Vikings been able to move up to 14 in the draft, they wouldn't have taken a guy like Tristan Wirfs from, from Iowa. They would have just taken Jefferson eight picks earlier than they ended up doing, assuming that's true. Um, so, it, 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 yeah. I mean, there were... Uh, the guard from Ohio State, uh, JJ something, it like like me, Joe Johnson, like... His, like Jonah Jackson or something. I forget what his name is off the top of my head right now. Um, they could have taken him like in the fifth round. I would have been a lot happier about that. But they did end up taking a few <laughs> Big Ten guys. Kenny, how do you pronounce that? I thought that was Willikies? a typo. I want to say, I wanna say it's Willikies. Willikies? I wanna... Willikers. Kenny right. Willikies. Um, he's a defensive end. We had two safeties taken. Brian Cole, the second out of Mississippi State, and Josh Metellus from Michigan. That was a C, according to Vikings.com. That doesn't get old to me. Um, I don't know. I, 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 it's a little surprising to see some of these grades from the team itself when this has been hailed as this amazing draft. Um, you know, I think for the while, GPA-wise, across all the major sites nationally, the Vikings had the best GPA until there was some recalculation, and then Dallas leapfrogged them. Um, I looked at 
a couple other drafts where the Vikings got unanimous A's, and the, the closest one was the 2016 draft where they went the the 23rd overall no the 21st overall pick they took a wide receiver from the SEC then they took um, a corner and then they took an offensive lineman and that's exactly what they did this year and everybody was ecstatic about Treadwell and his ability to um, some of the quotes I put in that article were like it's hard to see how these picks don't turn into superstars Treadwell isn't a burner but he's pro ready and there's a lot of the buzzwords that they always use but they were, are also using towards Jefferson and so I don't know I, I see some sort of cognitive dissonance between people who weren't sold on the Jefferson pick um, and in these later round picks they were kind of meh um, and, and where this is this hailed A plus draft because you would think to get to an A plus most of these picks would have to be A's or A pluses themselves but I don't know I'm tired uh, you know I don't want to keep crapping on the draft because it's bringing me nothing but negative energy on online but I mean that's kind of part of it I, I'm just speaking my mind I guess um, I wouldn't give it an F or anything. I was saying that uh, for effect the night of the draft um, on Twitter just to piss people off. Um, again, I'm a professional, but I, I would, I would, I don't know, man. Like you said, next year they got, what, tw tw maybe 12 picks. That's 39 picks in three years. That's astounding. Um, then again, you have drafts like last year. I mean, most of these seventh round picks aren't going to pan out for any team, but it just seems to me when when um, Spielman trades down to amass seventh round picks and the vast majority of them don't end up making the team, it almost would just be better to use the original pick that they had. I don't, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of his consistent need to trade down to mass picks that don't end up turning into anything outside of Oli Udo, of course. Rant over. That was the least fired up ever. You can tell I'm just ex <laughs> exhausted. I don't know. I don't know what to think, man. I don't know what to think about the team. I'm seeing I did a uh, rap or like a assessment of all of the post draft um, power rankings and the, man people are all over the place for the Vikings two of them had the Vikings at 5 one at 6 then you had a, a 10 a 13 a 20 and a 22 across all the sites um, I don't think people know what to make of this team like we talked about earlier though I think people need to pump the brakes on some sort of playoff run next year. I mean that they're in the midst of at least a mini rebuild, and and so I think people need to, to understand that and look at it from that perspective. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of disappointment coming into this year from a fan perspective and a writer perspective. I think. <laughs> yeah, I think if I had to rank them in a power ranking, I would probably put them around around 13 or 14 ish. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's probably where I would have them. Yeah, I I would say 15. I mean, they're still a lot of talent on this roster. Um, then again, though, in what we talked about before the show started, here's a, a, a talker that I probably put, should have put on the agenda because it's a, a relatively important question. Knowing what we know now and also knowing that Cousins will be due $45 million in 2022 and that amount will be guaranteed unless they, I don't know, trade him before the start of next season, but it, it'll be guaranteed at the start of the 2021 season. If they were to cut him next year, I think the dead cap is 60% of the salary cap. It's like 60-some million dollars. Wouldn't it have made sense to just let Cousins go and draft a replacement? Or do you think that they're just one or two picks away from this team going back and making a, a really quick bounce back return to 
uh, being in Super Bowl contention. I mean, there's just so many, so much youth on this defense, and knowing what we know about how long it, it's taken other corners, like we talked about earlier, um, to to acclimate. It just seems like why break the bank for a quarterback when, yeah. I think um, I think the Vikings are back in playoff contention at the latest next year. I think they're back next year at the at the very latest. Like I think twenty twenty one. 2021, for sure, I think they're back into playoff contention. Um, you still have to assess, like, there's a lot of big teams, but, th- I mean, things happen. I mean, I know in 2017, like, Aaron Rodgers being injured, Jimmy Garoppolo being injured kind of led to the Vikings being 13-3. and three. So, I know the Tampa Bay Buccaneers look all big and bad, but who knows what happens down the line. Uh, you know, the Saints could still lose Drew Brees and have Jameis Winston as their starting quarterback. Um so, I mean, you never know what happens, but I don't think the team is that far away from being in Super Bowl contention. I think we're we're honestly one good line away from being really good. Like, if we can solidify the offensive line for them to be really good, I think we're automatically a playoff team. Super Bowl contention, you of think, course, you're going to you, defense. Do you think that? I mean, obviously yeah. you just said it, but, I mean, just the, the amount of rookies playing corner to me just – I mean, maybe I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it, all of this through the lens of the Hall of Fame game of Trey Waynes getting all those pass interference penalties and extrapolating that out against, you know, two or three new guys. Mike Hughes kind of being a hit or miss guy thus far in his career for obvious reasons. Um, it just feels like. So, I mean, when yeah. when the Vikings are rolling, when their offensive line is playing good and they're rolling, this team, the off off offensively at least they're pretty hard to stop i mean dalvin cook can kill just about any team if he has the blocking and that's what we're missing we're missing consistent blocking against good teams now the defense is going to be slightly worse but we still have eric kendrick anthony barr anthony harris you know harrison smith and we still have daniel hunter and all these guys so we're our defense isn't going to be like bottom 20 or bottom bottom 15 or anything like that um so I'm thinking with the pieces that you have in place, if you look over at the Chiefs defense, the Chiefs kind of did the same thing. They have Tyron Matthews. They had uh, – who they have? They had Kendall Fuller, Chris Jones. They had this handful of guys who can make stops every once in a while, get the team – and get the ball back for the offense. Of course, we don't have Patrick Mahomes, but Kirk Cousins is beyond serviceable. Kirk Cousins is on the brink of being – he's always been on the brink of either being – a really good quarterback or an all-star quarterback. And he's good enough to score when given the time to be able to do that. And when you have guys like Adam Thielen, who's Adam Thielen is basically uncoverable. And I think we forget that because he was injured all last year, that he is really hard to cover. And then we have Justin Jefferson and we still have Dalvin Cook and we have all these weapons. We just, and I think, I do think we are one good offensive line away from being a playoff team as far as Super Bowl, we're going to need the defense to come back and get acclimated a little bit. But I don't think it's far-fetched to say that the Vikings can be in Super Bowl contention as early as 2021. Um, the funny thing about the Mahomes comparison is there was that Ian Rappaport tweet from last year during that five- or six-game span where Cousin was just playing lights out. His numbers were identical to Mahomes' numbers in 2018 when he won the MVP. Like, identical. It was very strange. Um, people don't realize that, that Cousins is capable. I think what people don't realize is that Cousins is fully capable of being. Now, he might not ever throw 50 touchdowns. That is absolutely insane. Even Mahomes probably won't do that more than once. And Mahomes has freaking Andy Reid in his corner pocket. So, um, Cousins will never throw 50 touchdowns, but he is fairly capable of being a top five quarterback in this league. Between weeks, what what was it? Between weeks five and like nine, he was the best quarterback in the NFL, like by far. So he's capable of it if you can keep him protection. The O line played lights out. If if you remember, I said Bradbury didn't. He gave up eight pressures. Uh, He gave up on average like half a pressure a game for ten weeks. And Kirk Cousins was balling out for those 10 weeks. So that's why I say with the line, we are a playoff team. Now, if the defense can get acclimated a little bit and we can reestablish our pass rush, I think we can be in Super Bowl contention. Yeah, I mean, 
I haven't really said this on this show, but I've, I mean, I think I was the first person in Vikings media to come out and like make a huge push for getting cousins. And a lot of people kind of, uh, on the podcast I used to do with, um, Luke Braun, he hated that, uh, take. And <laughs> this was before the draft. And I had, you know, presumed that they would replace Easton and, uh, Berger, which still hasn't really happened. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the main argument that I think pe- people got away from really the core issue last year, but there was just a lot of, why aren't they getting Cousins out of the pocket more? They need to roll them out of the pocket. Why did they stop doing that? So on and so forth. And you can't win in this league if you can't have a quarterback that can stand in the pocket because your line is so bad. You know what I mean? Like, people right. were more looking at Stefanski and saying, why don't they run more bootlegs? They only did 10. They should have done 40. Like, that's not a sustainable way to win. Um, you know, and Cousins is, is a lot more mobile than I think we gave him credit for coming in here. Like, a lot of people thought he was a lot more statuesque than he is. But you can't do – I mean, if – that's your answer that you got major problems and so again that's i guess where my concern lies again they bring Klein back um if they had Diggs still and i don't fault them for trading him i i I think that was the right move to make um i would feel a lot closer to where you're at i think because i always thought that what was needed to bring this team or get them over the hump was more of an offensive brand or state of mind, a more explosive offense. I think even at the peak of what we saw of Zimmer's defense, they just weren't like 2000 Ravens E enough to get them over the hump with a mediocre offense. And so, you know, I have a lot of faith that Kubiak can do that despite my lukewarm reception for this draft. Um, I really hope that I'm wrong about Jefferson and that he's just like a plug and play amazing guy that, you know, I've seen people like, legitimate people saying he'll make Minnesota fans forget about Diggs week one. That would be great. Again, tying this all together, if he has that chip on his shoulder like Moss did and he wants to light up these teams, awesome. Um, We'll see. I don't know, man. Um, uh, Last thing, were you a big BB guy? We haven't really Uh, talked about that. I was never a big BB guy. Um, the thing that kind of threw me off BB was that he, uh, I think he ran like a four six in college. Um, I always thought he was Track a lot well quicker. Numbers. Right, I always thought he was a lot quicker than he was fast, and he was like a he was like a Case Keenum, not Case, like an opposite Case Keenum. He was great in practice, but couldn't do anything in the game. I know he did yeah. like he had like that one play against Green Bay, but then never showed up, and he was like injured. So I just kind of fell off the BB high train, and also when I kind of realized that Adam Thielen was like a top like two what? three route runner and not route runner but top two three slot guy in NFL I didn't really see a use for Chad BB anymore. Um he did not run a four six forty. He ran a four seven three. Oh. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> that's all whole oh, I wow. Wow. Um wow. Yikes. Um I think we can uh, leave it at that. Do you have any um Articles coming up that you want to promote, or we do have some new writers starting in, in the next few days. Um, we are looking for off-season help in, from a writing um, perspective. I will be posting an article uh, today. If you want to uh, check that out, you can submit a writing sample either to me or to um, Kirby or Deshaun. Uh, Deshaun... Twitter handle is at Vikings fans 16, right? Yes. Okay. And mine is at V T P T S D, or you can just email me Joe at purple Um, stay tuned to, uh, well, I didn't let you to allow you to, to answer that question. Do you have any <laughs> um, articles coming up? Um, I think I'm going to try to venture down the road with Andre Patterson to see how he stacks up against other D-line coaches. But uh, other than that, I think I might do an analysis on Nate Stanley maybe Ooh. after finals week. That finals week's coming out next week, but after that I'll be free to delve down all these dark roads. Just skip them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm doing a lot of highlighting of our – new community and our new uh, Minnesota sports podcast only 
website, purpleterritoryradio.com. There's over 30 Minnesota sports podcasts on there, including Gleaming in the Geek, Climbing the Pocket, This Show, Morning Joe's, Load the Box, so on and so forth. Um, if you're looking for new podcasts, um, or YouTube shows, you can go there and see new episodes every single day. Beyond that, um, what we're building in regards to our community uh, internally is going to be extrapolated out, I think, on, on a lot wider basis. I don't want to give too much away, but we're on the precipice of rolling out a new website and app that we hope will kind of bring a new angle to the game in regards to how people read, listen, watch, talk, and even, like, go to games and share things online and we're very excited for that um that should be ready to go in the in the coming months i can tell you the name because i already have it's oofta um oofta.mn one is the site even though there's nothing there right now so check that out but all the features are live on both vikings territory and purple ptsd we have user groups message boards live chat um, an internal uh, Twitter-like system with hashtags and video and Instagram um, integration abilities where you can add followers, friends, DM people. It's pretty crazy. So um, hopefully people will uh, register and, and want to join our message board, especially if that's what we're looking to grow right now. I have over a 1,000 people that have registered in the last uh, about three and a half weeks. So join the party uh it's like an eighth grade dance right now there's a lot of people <laughs> but nobody's participating so hopefully uh, um people will start uh, chatting so i can stop using that analogy uh but this has been about the labor for the fourth of may hope everyone's staying safe out there and we will catch up with you guys next week let's go <laughs> mm <laughs>